Today we're going to chat about workflow. What is it? Why is it important? And how can it improve your still life photography? My name is Max Bridge. You can find me on squaremountain.co.uk and on Instagram at square underscore mountain. Workflow within photography is essentially how we get from point A to point B. In Photoshop, it's how we go from our raw file to our final edited product. Do we start by cleaning the product or are we starting by making it a composite? Is our second step to make contrast adjustments or are we color grading? By having a clear structure in mind for all those mundane tasks that you perform on every single image, it allows you to actually be more creative. Now, that may sound strange, but really it frees up your mind to only think about the creative parts of your image. Now, to demonstrate this, I'm going to take you through an image I created some time ago, so let's head straight into Photoshop. I think of my workflow in terms of stages, with each stage having a bunch of tasks be performed. There's the image capture stage, raw processing stage, creation of the comp, cleaning, making contrast corrections, making color corrections, and checking slash inspection stage. Um, now, this is an image I created a little while ago, so I'm going to take you through this. Um, but just to begin with, like I said, the first stage is the image capture stage. Now, I use Capture One. You could use Lightroom. It's really up to you. Um, but so with me, this is an image I was just doing recently. It was just a very simple image of a wine bottle on a white background with a reflection. Now, the adjustments that I make within Capture One will always vary. Um, with this, it's more of an e-commerce shot, so I wanted to get most of the adjustments done in Capture One and not leave very much for photo. Photoshop. Um, but you can see here, so there's sharpening corrections made. Uh, I've added some clarity, a curve, a levels adjustment, uh, a white balance just to make sure the colors are correct, and then a diffraction correction. Um, now, if I was working on more of you know, one of my higher end still life images like this one, uh, there'd then be focus stacking as well. So if you imagine here, this hasn't been focus stacked, but imagine just that it has, uh, I'd make sure the adjustments from this one were copied across all the rest of them. I'd then right click on it, go edit with, select Helicon focus down here, which is already selected and dial in the correct parameters there. I'd then click edit, that would send it to Helicon focus. I'd do the stack, save that, and it would appear back in Capture One. I would then take that photo into Photoshop, and then we start in the comp phase, the creation of the comp. Now, most of my still life images do involve one to one degree or another, some form of, of comping. And now what I mean by that is that you might fo photograph uh, each element separately and then composite them together within uh, Photoshop. So in this instance, I think most of this was done uh, in one shot, but even here, so if we go to this bottle layer here and the comp group, you can see there were a few. So there was an image which was just the bottom of the bottle uh, and then the top of the bottle just up here. And then we have one for the neck and we also had one for the main label. Um, so the first step would have been just getting all of those together, creating my comp. Now, as you'll notice here, the layers aren't necessarily in the same order. Now, that's just because of how Photoshop works. You know, sometimes you need certain layers above certain other ones. That's just how things are. Don't think that your workflow has to mean that everything has to be in that order in the layers. It's just the order in which you work in. Uh, so having created my comp, um, you can see there's also other little ones for the glass here. I mean, what actually happened with this image, I photographed the whole thing together. So with the table, the background, everything there, the glass and the bottles all done together. But then I also photographed them separately so that I had the maximum amount of control in Photoshop. So if I just turn everything off, you see there's a, a bit for the table uh, and then there's the bottle and the glass and the reflections as well. I mean, they were actually together. I've just separated them using masks. You see these masks here? I've just separated them like that just so that I can have the maximum amount of control. Um, so having done that, I then move on to cleaning. Having done the comp, I move on to cleaning. So first step here, I clean the table. Doesn't matter how I did it really. Um, I did actually make a tutorial recently on cleaning, um, which I can link to here for you. Um, and that just covers all the ways that I use for cleaning. I tend to do the same things every single time because uh, it doesn't really need to be anything special. And um, what I do is I use some frequency separation actions. 
Uh, and then I also do some spot healing, uh, occasionally dust and scratches, and some painting as well. So I have actions set up to do all of that just to make it as quick as possible. Now, if you head to that video, there is a free action I've included for my frequency separation action. So if you jump over to that video, you can download those for free. Uh, so having done the cleaning to the table, I also have my group here, clean and fix. And that would have been other elements on the bottle. So if I toggle this on and off, you'll see there's a distracting line down this edge of the bottle. There was a, a hard edged highlight that I didn't like there. There were some bubbles on the glass here and lots of other little dust removal. So see if I toggle that on and off, you can see all the changes there. I'll just zoom in, you can see here. Uh, so you can see I removed all of these bubbles just down here and did a whole bunch of other things. Uh, next stage in my personal work, for remember yours doesn't have to be exactly the same, this is just what I do, is contrast corrections. So if we toggle this on and off, now you've got to think when you're shooting in RAW, uh, it's not like shooting in JPEG, there's not been tons of, uh, I mean they're not really adjustments because it, it, that's not really what it is, um, but there's, let's just say it in that way. There's not been tons of adjustments made by your camera, you're getting the RAW file, whereas with a JPEG, there would be certain adjustments having been made to contrast, sharpness, all those kinds of things. So you need to dial that stuff in as you're editing. Uh, now my contrast adjustments here, you can see I wanted to add more of a shadow underneath the table. I wanted to give the image in general a bit more of a darker feel. I wanted to bring more emphasis to the the highlights on top of the bottle, to the label, to the text, to bring down the glass a little bit, to fix the cloudy liquid here. So that was all done there and generally it's always the same thing. Uh, I have targeted contrast adjustments which I do by layer masks. So that one was just for the, the label itself, the text, uh, and then there'd be you know, a bit for the glass here, for the ice cubes, you know, different uh, masks don't have to be as precise as other ones. Uh, there you go, that's for the, the glass of the bottle. You know, all these kind of targeted adjustments. Sometimes I do a, a general contrast layer as well, but it'll just depend on the image. Uh, so having done my contrast adjustments, I then move on to color corrections. Now, color corrections in still life photography are just that, they're corrections. We're not trying to change the product because we're trying to create an accurate representation. Um, so as such, as I toggle this on and off, you won't see a massive change. You know, I've, I've altered the luminosity of the highlight here because I thought it was a bit too strong and I wanted to bring more emphasis to the bottle. But the colors haven't changed too much. What I actually would have done is taken the bottle underneath a color corrected lamp and then looked at the color of the label, looked at the color of the bottle and made sure it was all accurate. Uh, one of the most important steps I also do is this layer here. This is called exaggerate colors. And then when you're editing color, I often find you don't really notice when there are certain other colors in your image that you didn't want to be there. You know, you're editing along, you're thinking, oh yeah, the color just looks all great. But then when you add my layer here, or you add any, any layer, don't have to be my layer. Uh, when you add a layer here uh, and you, what I do is I, uh, I bump up the saturation massively and then you turn that on and it really clearly shows you all the colors in your image. Now the blue on these ice cubes doesn't really bother me too much, but if there were other colors entering your image, let's say if you had something in your room that was causing some kind of a, a color bounce, it would be really obvious here. Um, so that's what the color correction stage is about. It's getting rid of those colors you don't want and it's making sure everything else is accurate. Now, if you wanna be creative at this stage, that's fine. I just wouldn't go too crazy on the actual product itself because you want it to be an accurate representation. Uh, and then the very, very last stage I go through is the checking slash inspection stage. Now, this is when I check the image. So I have an action here. I'm really big on actions. I always create my own actions. I actually have a video I'm gonna make soon, which is how to create actions. But So this one, I'll run it, you'll see what it does. It creates three different layers. The top two here are more to do with the portraits. If this black and white check layer really ups the contrast, really makes it obvious when there are imperfections in a person's skin, makes it very easy to, to remove those and see where the problem areas are. Uh, the solar curve here, this is the one I mainly use for still life. Now it's not so obvious on this image here because I've already edited it uh, and also it's not got the type of background that will show this too much and obviously this table already has a lot of imperfections in it. Um, but if you were to be editing say this image here with a more clean background and let's say you'd added some, some splashes or some clouds, you'd done a composite. If you added that solar curve, you'd really see if you'd made your masks correct, if you'd made them perfect. And the reason I do that is because, you know, sometimes different monitors show things differently. When you're printing, it comes out differently and you wanna make sure there's not gonna be any errors at that stage. So that's why I have the check stage as my last one. Once all the edits have been made, I add those check layers 
And then that's it. I know that the image is correct and perfect. Another thing I'd like to point out at this stage is that by having a, a workflow in mind, by knowing exactly what you're going to be doing at each stage, you're able to evolve that workflow. By having these set of tasks you always do, you're able to, to see what's working, see what's not working and change it. So as I showed you here with the, the comp in this image, you see how it was all done in this section. What I actually do now is I've changed this, I've evolved it slightly. I use something called linked smart layers. Now this is a slightly more recent image uh, and this is how I do the comp now. So you see the symbol here, this is a linked smart layer. Now again, I've already made a video of this, so I'll link to that uh, here. Uh, and if you're interested in finding out more about linked smart layers, be sure to watch that. But so what I do, I use the linked smart layer, you click on that, I do my comp in a separate Photoshop document. So this is where all the comp is now. Now the reason I I do this at the moment is for speed. Uh, I find that by splitting the documents up, it has a big increase in speed and that makes it really good for computing power. Uh, so that's how my personal workflow has evolved over time. Now, like I said, the great thing about this is there's all these mundane tasks that you do to every single image. Cleaning, contrast corrections, making your comp, doing all those things you do for every image. And by having a good workflow in mind, it frees you up to only think about the creative. You're no longer going, what should I do next? Should I create a new layer and then start doing some clone stamping and cleaning here? Or should I be now doing dodging and burning and creating a curve, dragging it down, uh, inverting the layer, and then doing some dodging and burning. You don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to think. You know what you're doing at every step of the way. And therefore, like I said, it frees you up to be more creative. That's it for today on workflow. I know it's not the most glamorous of topics, but honestly, it's one of the most important things you can do to improve your skills as a retoucher. By having some sort of consistency across your retouching, you're able to see where you're going wrong, where you can improve, and as you do evolve as a retoucher, you can bring those new techniques into your workflow. Now, if you wanna see either of the videos that I referenced today, you can just click on both of the links there, and please do subscribe so that you don't miss any of my future videos. All right, thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you next time.